we're talking about planning. Right, we've been talking about state spaces. I think I, we talked about the little, vacu the little vacuum world example where you've got the little robot in the world and this is a very simple just two room world and there, there are different actions you can carry out that take you from one state of the world to another state of the world. We don't have any unvacuum action, so I guess this is kind of an irrevocable, you know, moment of crisis in the robot's life. Like, am I going to do this? There's no going back now. Um, but there ought to be another arrow going, going this way. The robot can go to the, I guess that's the left. Uh, and the robot can also go right. So, uh, so we talked about planning by, by thinking, imagining yourself in the, in the current state and imagining doing the different actions and seeing what states you get to and then imagining where you can go from there. This is single agent, deterministic, discrete state planning, right? We did all that lingo last time. And this question says, okay, fine, deterministic actions, right? I'm in a state, I take an action, I end up in another state. Fine, deterministic, I get it. What, what, it does the things get more complicated when actions are non-deterministic? Who wants to hazard an answer to that? Is, is, is planning with non-deterministic actions? More, compli more complex. Yes. yes, absolutely. So that's going to be assignment like four, um, planning in a, in a, a non-deterministic world. And um, it's a very interesting question how much you can get away with. Like can you use deterministic techniques um, for planning in a non-deterministic world? Um, but there are definitely cases where you would not want to do that. So for example, um, let's say that uh, I'm here in this state and there's, I can do action A and there's a 51% chance that I go to Nirvana and a, oops, let's see, and a 49% chance that I go to how do you draw burning flames of hell? Uh, <laughs> um, to badness, so 49% chance you go to badness. Um, and then there's action B, which, um, let's see, what shall B do? B is gonna take us to Nirvana with, uh, let's say 100% <laughs> chance. Um, not go there, but let's say B is very expensive like it costs you 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and A, let's say A, you can get A for just, you know, like, I don't know, eight bucks, right? A is cheaper and chances are it takes you to Nirvana. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> so planning deterministically, like if you take, oh, I'm just gonna simplify it. Let's just replace each action uh, outcome with the most likely one, right? So then everyone will take A, and there's a 49% chance that they'll burn in hell. So it, you do want to take the probabilities into account when you're dealing with a non-deterministic problem. So that's the answer to that question. Um, unless you want to burn in hell, <laughs> which is totally your choice. Um, okay. Uh, Let's see. Here's this, this, there's, these are some involved questions here. Uh, and they have to do with duplicates, duplicate states. Um, so let's forget non-deterministic planning because we're totally not doing that for a while. Um, I love the way I can replace the contents of the whiteboard just instantaneously. I really do like that. Um, so we talked a little bit last time about duplicates. Um, no. Let's see, can I just scoot that up? And so here, for example, uh, I, could go, I could decide to go left. Right? And if I were to do that, I would end up in a state of the world that, in fact, I had already been to. 
Now, this little boxy thing is supposed to represent the state of the world. That's the state. And this circle thing, what's that called? Node, that's the node. What's the G value of this node? Yeah. Equals two. So, um, of course, this is the same as the root state. So there's an entire copy of this tree underneath this node. And I really don't want to waste my time looking at that. So um, if you're a search algorithm worth your salt, um, you keep track of all the states you've seen. And this is a completely distinct node, but it represents the same state. And so we want to keep some kind of data structure that will allow us to very quickly check, have I ever seen this state before? If so, um, have I seen it with a better G value, or is this the best copy of that state that I have? What's a good data structure we could use for that? I'm sorry. Let's use hand, the hand thing where you raise the hands and then I call on someone. A hash table? Yeah, exactly. Hash table. So um, that hash table is also often called a closed list. But don't let the fact that it's called a closed list lead you astray and implement it using an actual list where you have to linearly scan through. Please don't do that, OK? Um, use a hash table. Um, so that's, called, that's one way of doing duplicate detection. Now, what's the, what's the downside of that, of duplicate detection? The good thing is like, I don't repeat all that work. And the bad thing is, yeah. Like, all the, every time I generate a new node, I allocate a new, I, I have to remember it. Every time I see something, I have to remember it so that I can see, check if I've ever seen it before. Um, so it does take up all, a lot of memory, which is too bad. So you have a choice. Like, do you want to repeat? exponentially large amounts of work, or do you want to use memory linear in your running time? So there's actually been a lot of work on planning algorithms that use disk, because they use so much memory, they, they overflow RAM. I got Matt a computer with 48 gigs of RAM, and the first thing he did was use all of it up. So now I bought him 24 hard disks, and you have to buy a very fancy computer to get to connect lots of disks at one time. And he's now he's filling up the disks, uh, but he hasn't run out of the he hasn't run the disks out of uh, he hasn't gone over six terabytes of disk yet. So yeah, yeah. So there actually is a lot of work in AI on how do you put the stuff on disk because it just takes so much memory if you want to solve a big problem. Um, so, all right. So that's so someone was people were asking about duplicates and. Uh, Someone here said, uh, well, rather than just recognizing which moves I don't want to make, like I don't want to go to this place I've been before, why don't we focus on finding moves that I do want to make? And we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. So keep that in mind. Um, and this person says, well, OK, duplicates, fine. We want to we wanna, we wanna recognize duplicates. Um, do I have to check, do I have to remember everything I've seen, or do I just have to worry about two duplicate states in a row? Or what, how, many, how much of the stuff do I really have to remember? That's the question. Will you guys have thoughts on that? Dan, you've been talking a lot. So this is the last time I'll call on you for the next 20 minutes. What's the <laughs> exactly. Go to the corner. <laughs> what were you going to say, though? Uh, yeah. Got to remember the whole thing. If you really want to catch duplicates, you got to remember everything you've seen. Because, I mean, if, unless you know something special about the structure of the state space, I mean, as if you're just some generic planning algorithm, as far as you know, like the children of this node could be anything. We could have a, uh, we, you know, could go from this state to some other state, and if that's possible, I have to remember. In order to recognize that I'm a, I could, if I'm going to recognize something I've seen before, and those these next children could be any state in the state space, then I really have to have instant, constant time access to everything that I've ever done. There are certain state spaces where we know they have a special structure, and so you can limit the amount you have to remember. But that's really fancy voodoo that we're not doing in this class. So.
Don't worry about that. But you can talk to Matt about it if you want, because he knows all about that. Um, and your name is Tyler, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm f I, I tried to do my homework. Brilliant, yes. So, so we're only going to keep one copy of this state. Yes. That one or this one? You want to keep the one with g equals 0 or g equals 2? Zero. Yeah, so you're going to, the instant you generate this child, and that's a technical term, generate. There's, it's called node expansion when you generate all the kids. And uh, uh, the instant you generate a, a, a child, you check to see if, it's a if it represents a duplicate state. If it does, you check the G value. Is the new copy worse? Throw it away. We don't need to keep a second copy around. That's the whole point is not only are we not going to explore it, we're not even going to store it. Because we've already stored this copy, and this copy is demonstrably better than that one. Namely, it's got a lower G. Exactly. Everyone understand Todd's point? All right. Yeah, absolutely. You implement your expand function any way you want. Um, yeah, so, so that's a great point. Nathan's saying, uh, you know, I'm here, I'm on dirt. I can prove that the vacuum action is the optimal thing to do because any plan in where I'm not vacuuming uh, is going to be longer. If going through this, any plan that goes through this node that doesn't vacuum is going to be longer than the one where I do vacuum. Longer or the same length. Like you can't, you can't be, you can't make matters non-optimal to vacuum. Yeah, absolutely. I think the reference solution does that. I'm not totally sure. I think so. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's room for that. 